Hey everybody, it's 8 a.m. And I was just taking your quiz. Um, and uh, there's stuff on there. I will look very carefully if it's on your review sheet because I don't remember. And if I don't see it, I'll tack it on to the end because I was flummoxed by a few like, where did that come from? So I definitely want to mention uh, some of these uh, wacky ones. I must have scrambled it up um, a bit. So. Wow, yesterday Canvas exploded and I couldn't get into any of my things and one of my 305s missed their final review. And so this is being, I know it sucks. So this is being recorded um, for them so that we can um, help. So if you want, um, if you don't want to be seen, you can uh, get off camera or if not, I don't know if Zoom even records the camera. So who knows? Okay, so here we go. All right, final slide review. What the heck? She had a uh, she had a weird name. I think it was Beatrix Kiddo. Isn't that her name in uh, Kill Bill? Um, so why would we be looking at this image? There's something about um, I'm gonna have to use what I just wrote down. Uh, Quentin Tarantino and the quality of his storytelling in the book. So there's something about the way that he um, unrolls a story. And actually it's very similar to the surrealist um, Cecini Paz and Peep, Rene Magritte, uh, how Rene Magritte um, plays with your expectations that a narrative will continue. But in Tarantino movies, there's something about the narrative um, that if you guys don't know now, you need to sort of search the book for. It's out of order. Out of order or called fractured narrative, which means exactly that it starts in the end and it goes back to the beginning and then it goes to the middle and then back to the end and then the middle. So it's called fractured narrative, which is very postmodern right, to scramble everything up and sort of reorder things. Um, what is this a still from? Does anybody recognize this? And you're all very young, I understand. That's Jimmy Stewart, that's a big camera. It's from an Alfred Hitchcock movie called Rear Window. Um, does anyone know how Hitchcock played out in our book? It was actually that there was a big article written about him and his films. Does anyone remember? So you need to look for Laura Mulvey, right? Visual ple pleasure in narrative cinema and how she discusses Alfred Hitchcock movies and how they have scopophilia or the pleasure of looking. And it's a bit voyeuristic, like you're looking at something you're not supposed to. A lot of Hitchcock's movies are about peeping at people, like in Psycho, he looks at her in the shower in rear window, he's sort of spying on his neighbors. How does that relate to art history? What are we often looking at in art history? plants and flowers. You guys can totally talk. That's the whole point of this. We're looking at art history. Yes, but what's the subject matter? Plants. What mostly are we looking at when we look at art? People. The depiction of what's mimesis or the imitation of life. What's biblical subject matter? What's Greco-Roman subject matter? Is it plants? We're Is looking it? at people and mostly naked people. <laughs> we're, we're peeping at beautiful women and people, you know, the, you know, uh, Rubens, um, Castor and Pollux taking the daughters of Lysippus, things like that. So we're looking at these, you know, kind of sex or violence or things, but we're looking, we have a pleasure in looking. Um, so that's why we often use this um, like film article as in relation to art history. 
who painted this? He's actually more famous for a different painting. Was it John Berg or no? No, no. close, it's an American painter. Is this jibing with your list or is this totally not so bonkers? It's not jibing with the list. What the hell? Is this jibing with the list? Is this on the list? Is this all scrambled up? It's a little scrambled up. It's on the, some of that's on the list. Okay, you guys will circle or make a big question mark of, of things that I don't cover. Okay. So this is actually this guy. Does anyone recognize it now? Isn't it Edward Hopper? Yes, Edward yeah. Hopper's Nighthawks, remember? And this would have been in the last part because this was, I think this was painted in 1942. And oh, does anyone see the problem in the uh, one that I chose? Thank you, Denise. Yes, it's a very lonely feeling. Does anybody see the big problem uh, and how I should have caught that? Yeah, the Doctor Who, the big Doctor Who TARDIS. Estefania uh, behind the couple. Yeah, that's not supposed to be there. I am so sorry. This is a serious art history class. Yeah, um, this without the TARDIS in the background is Nighthawks. And it's about how um, you're alone in the big city. You could think all the way back to Constables the Haywain and about people who are already looking back at the past as being like this wonderful place. Well, now that everybody's living in the big city, they probably lived there their entire life. Um, this is probably like two or three in the morning. Fluorescent lighting had just been invented, but it creates a very eerie sort of strangeness inside. A plate glass window goes all the way around, but there's no doors that you can see. There's a door for this guy to get out, but nowhere for these people to get out. The shop fronts are very empty and deserted. There's no sign of life in the windows above. The whole thing is very hollow. And even the people sitting together are like alone. Even though they're together, they're alone. And you come together for food during the holidays because that's warmth and friendliness and there's no food. There's just coffee or salt or things. So the whole thing is very empty and devoid of feeling. And that's what Hopper does. So in New York movie from 1939, she's in one of these fabulous movie palaces, but she's lost in her own thoughts, right? So she should be having a grand old time, but this is the alone in a crowd feeling that you get from um, Edward Hopper. Did I want to say any more about him? Okay, he's not on my haunt list. Okay. What's the deal with postmodernism? So if you had to describe postmodernism, you would say Quentin Tarantino's uh, movies are very postmodernism, the sort of the rearranging of the traditional. What else? I would say they were avant-garde. Yes, avant-garde is, is very valued in postmodernism, although it was present in modernism, or to be ahead of your time. Um, is, does postmodernism reference pop culture all the time? Yes. Uh, so a big part of postmodernism is to be ironic or witty or sort of throw back to older things and see if you recognize it or if you get the joke. Um, it's about no more oil on canvas, lone genius, um, brand new visual language. Actually, a lot of it is quoting other things that you would recognize out of uh, pop culture. It's collaborative. It's bringing so-called low art to the high. Like that's why you see knitting and crafts um, raised up into uh, museums, things like that. So postmodernism is something that happens certainly after 1955, after Jackson Pollock, who was sort of the last of the big time modernists because he was doing brand new stuff. Um, and, and Andy Warhol would be a postmodernist or somebody who does not, certainly not one of a kind. He does so silk screens, which you can churn out um, of celebrity or consumer icons, which is also not original. So that makes him postmodern. So anytime you're struggling with it, think Jackson Pollock is a modernist, Andy Warhol is a postmodernist. Who's this dude? Remember him? We sort of skated by him. Jeff Koons. Yes. So balloon dogs. You guys know him better for, for balloon dogs. Um, why does the press sometimes consider him, or why do people sometimes consider him 
a bit illegitimate because what does he use very very consciously and i just kind of freudian slip gave it away celebrities uh, uh are, are actually his own i mean yeah exploiting celebrity images but so does warhol but as conceptual art so he comes up with the idea and then contracts it out for other people to do it yes absolutely and he's also very calculated about using the media and using the press for his own self-publicity so he is one of the, the the artists who you could say is absolutely most conscious of the fact that you have to be sensational and big and get the press's attention and court the press and it's very symbiotic that he's not one of those artists who's like i don't care if people like me or they don't he's like oh no i hey yeah hey, yeah hey, i need the press to pay attention to me and so some critics find that very disingenuous and kind of off-putting but he definitely having been a stockbroker and deciding that he would make more money as an artist he is definitely very calculated when it comes to getting the attention um what can you do with television events what can you do with them? So you videotape something. Is that what goes on camera? Let me see. You can edit them. You can add ads to them. You can, uh, so editing, like you can cut them. You can add dramatic uh, music. You can cut parts out of what somebody is saying to manipulate what they're saying. So they're endlessly um, malleable. So television events are endlessly editable and so you have to you have to you're not ever seeing the pure feed you're seeing something through layer upon layer upon layer of filters right so you always have to be aware <coughs> look at this sweet man okay so rudyard kipling what was the member what was the big deal from plain tales from the hills remember that guy Look into him, you'll come to it. So Plain Tales from the Hills, Rudyard Kipling. Okay, so gender stereotypes. So what was the painting that I said, poor, poor painter, this painting is always used to talk about gender stereotypes, even though the painter himself never, never intended it to be about that. Anybody remember there's three dudes going like this. There's a dad in the middle and there's a bunch of women on the other side. So Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatii is often used to, to um, talk about gender stereotypes and how men are you know, upright and strong and women are sort of folded over upon themselves and very emotional. But this could also be used to describe um, Apollonian and Dionysian personalities in the Greek way, how the Apollonian personality or the Mr. Spock personality is the more valued one to be logical and cool and calm and collected. Whereas the Dionysian one, the god of you know, wine, women and song is um, out of control, over emotional, the emotions sort of overwhelm the, the, the rational thought. And so sometimes there are uh, stereotypes that are, you know, this is a, obviously a bipolar opposition, but stereotypes that are applied to one and the other, um, which devalue both. I'm not saying that only women's ones are devaluing and these ones aren't. Both of them sort of uh, give short shrift to the other. Oh my goodness. So I wanted to show you an image of that we haven't seen before, <clears throat> but I said this guy is mostly known for the dude in a bowler hat with an apple in front of his face. Does anybody remember? So we haven't seen this image before. But we've seen his surrealistic cartoonish style paintings that play with your idea that a narrative has to have a beginning middle and end does anyone remember who that was it's not dali i only remember that the painting is called son of man i'm pretty sure this one yeah okay oh wow you're so you're so sophisticated this is who's the painter I honestly cannot remember. That's good. I'm so impressed. Um, I'm so impressed with the first answer. Rene, good one. Rene Magritte, right? So remember Sassini Paz and Peep, this is not a pipe. Remember man reading a newspaper where there's the dude in the upper corner and then he leaves and never comes back. 
remember the menaced assassin where the guy is sort of casually listening to the radio and there's the dead lady on the bed and then the three heads in the window and two guys waiting to club him on the head. This is his version of surrealism and it is very dreamlike. There's no rationality, there's no logic, there's no narrative. Why is there an, is it affixed to his hat? It doesn't look like it. Does it, see, does it seem to bother him? No, this is like those random images that you get when you're deeply asleep and you go, woo, what was that? So Rene Magritte, surrealism and narrative in images and how we expect there to be a reason or an answer. And in his paintings, there are none, which make him so interesting. What was Dada? First of all, what war was Dada a reaction to? World War II. Almost. It was World War One. World War One. World War One was, I mean, we think of World War II as being ferocious. World War One was an absolute bloodbath. And they had these giant machines of war. They had horrible chemical warfare. So it was as technologically and chemically advanced as you could possibly get. I mean, they were melting people out. They're horrible. And people came back with PTSD or didn't come back at all. Remember, we talked about all those art groups that happily enlisted and, you know, half of them returned. So Dada was a reaction to World War I because what, would, what were they saying? Why is it a nonsense anti-art movement? Because they're against originality? They are, because if all of those geniuses got us into this war, and if all of these cultural institutions, then apparently cultural institutions mean nothing. And all of our systems mean nothing and all of our traditions. And therefore that means top to bottom. So all of our art traditions of the one of a kind original oil on canvas, Art must be carefully prepared and thought out with preparatory sketches. And then, to, and that's why it just completely throws everything to the side. Who would you consider to be sort of the father of Dada? There's a name that you should always go Dada, this guy. Duchamp. Yes, Marcel Duchamp. Perfect, perfect. So Dada, Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> wow, that's a... I think he's undressing us all with his eyes. Who is this fellow anyway? Picasso. Yeah, it's Picasso because he was so wildly famous throughout his life and lived through the 60s and he was photographed because he was recognized as a genius. Um, what ism did Picasso originate and, and develop? Cubism. Cubism, wonderful, right? So we see cubism in, and good Estefania, in we see proto-cubism and cubism um, in some of his works. Can you name some of his works that are cubist? Or proto-cubist, meaning, you know, he's working it out. Remember the ugliest painting ever made? Does anyone remember? Is it like else? less? Uh, Demoise? Yes, like Demoiselle like Stavignon. Yeah. You genius. Yes, Demoiselle Stavignon. Remember the the multiple uh, perspective. Two two ladies are laying down. One's sort of coming in from the side. One's squatting. It's very unattractive. Um, that is directly based on his observations of another painting's works. Who was that? Remember, like my third grader could do this. It's just apples. What was it called? The keystone of one of many keystones of modern art. Cezanne, what was the title of the painting? It's very literal of what you're looking at. Multiple perspectives, warm colors come forward, cool colors recede. Basket of apples. Basket of apples. Cezanne's basket of apples. So the one time that it's Picasso goes somewhere, sees these paintings, freaks out, and it's not people meet Picasso, see his work, freak out. He goes and sees an, a Cezanne exhibit and absolutely flips out, loves multiple perspectives, starts working it out and working it out, and also breaking things down, both people and things, into geometric 
shapes. And so he's working on it in Demoiselles d'Avignon. He is working on it with the portrait of, portrait of Gertrude Stein. Remember, her, who was Gertrude Stein? And we might go, th- go over her portrait later. Writer. She was a writer. She's an American writer. And what was she always urging Picasso to do? What you got to do, Picasso, is what she was trying to do in writing. She wanted him to do in art, which is what? Find a new what? A totally brand new visual language, right? Remember, you got to find a brand new visual language. I'm going to try and find a brand new written language. And both of them would go off and do their thing. Remember, he tried to paint a portrait of her. She sat for over 90 times and he eventually erases her face and replaces it with what? One of his collection of what? He had a big collection of these. Sometimes it's called primitivism or European painters and how at this period they absolutely loved these things and they collected them. Was it poems? No, that's a good guess though. Okay, you guys are gonna have to look into that. All right, what is this? So cool. What's the group called, first of all? What did they want to unmire Italy from? They said Italy is too obsessed with ancient Rome, too obsessed with the Renaissance. So what were they looking forward to? Okay. Yes, Estefania, Italian futurism, right? They were the futurists and what did they want? What did they want? Movement, right? So the movement of horses and humans, uh, they wanted um, machine-like motion. They wanted humans with replaceable parts. They wanted children to be playing with toys of war. Um, What war did they all enthusiastically and excitedly join? And Umberto Boccione. World War II. No, (laughs) almost. The, The other one. World War One. Excellent job. Yes, World War One. I. I remember, so J.R.R. Tolkien's literary group. Half, you know, half of them don't return. C.S. Lewis's group goes in. Does half of them don't return? The Blue Rider movement. Remember, Vasily Kandinsky, Franz Mark dies there, and then Umberto Boccioni dies there. But what happens to the leader of the uh, Italian Futurist movement, Marinetti? It does he, when he returns from World War I, is he like, oh, no more war. Whose culture minister does he become? Mussolini. Yes. Oh, nobody, just Mussolini. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. But, di- but did they unmire Italy from its glorious past? Is this unlike anything that they had seen before? This is incredible. You can see movement in motion. Um, the faceless armor-like outside, and you can see it kind of moving forward. This thing's incredible. It's absolutely amazing. Who is the artist attached to this? Is that Picasso? Yes! And what's this called? And this is a big hint, this stuff here. It has to do with like his perspective of, and what he was looking at, but I can't remember the name of it. Yes. So still life with, with what's this? It says chair, the weaving. Yes. Still life with chair caning. Chair okay. Caning. So what technique? Yes. It's a, it's like a cafe experience. Exactly. So you're looking through the glass top of a cafe table and he has pushed his chair in so now it's under the table 
You see the coffee cup here, the lemon wedge, the toast points with the little bites taken out of it, la journal, the newspaper, and jouer also means to play. So he's playing with your perspectives. Um, it's cubist and it's fabulous. And what else is it? Oh, Assemblage. good one. What did you say? Assemblage. Uh, uh, no, back it up to, so assemblage would be like a shoebox with stuff in it. Another age word. Collage. Collage from the French colère, meaning to glue. So because this isn't real chair caning, it's actually wallpaper that looks like chair caning. So he stuck that to this. And then he puts this actual rope here. Everything else is flat. So collage, excellent. I can, I'm so glad you came up with that word. Collage is this. Assemblage would be like um, the liberation of Aunt Jemima. So anytime you see it looks like a shoebox, that's assemblage. Okay, excellent. Good job. So, oh, so this, Laura Mulvey, she still keeps writing on this theme. Remember, we talked visual pleasure and narrative cinema and how she had this landmark article about scopophilia or the pleasure of looking in Hitchcock's um, movies and how that relates to art history and how art historians have sort of you know sucked that um, article into our stuff is because it's about uh, looking at things and looking at subjects and looking at women as art history. Um, if we see a giant coca-cola in a kid's head what must what chapter must this be be about? Ads. Yes, ads or te advertisements, television commercials. So what is this issue being shown here? Advertising to whom? The children. Mm -hmm. Children. And, and when you create a television commercial, um, you, the advertiser tries to frame their products in an ideological construct. What do I mean by that? So what do they want to show? Miserable, poor people lying on the street after having vomited or something? What do they want to show you? That their product will cause what? Fulfillment, happiness. Fulfillment, beauty, happiness, togetherness, smiling. Um, so that's, that's a construct that they're creating. So it's it's the after effect of the product. Even when you see people drinking Coca-Cola, they're deliriously happy. They're ha ha, you just, you can't believe it. And that's, that's the, they're pushing the, the you know, emotional effects or the ideological construct uh, more than the, the product. They're not saying, hurry, hurry, you know, Coca-Cola, it has this chemical in it, that chemical in it, it's absolutely delicious. That's not what they're doing. Um, that's very old timey. Your life being better with it. The idea that you need something, Denise, yeah, and Christopher, perfect to, to, to fulfill yourself. So absolutely. What's the problem with advertising to children? What was people were sort of going, now, wait a minute. What was that all about? Was it when they were creating like cartoons that was basically one big long advertisement versus a story? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and the argument is that, um, do kids have the, the cynicism, the intelligence, the, the mental defenses that we have against no. advertising? No, no, they don't. My son was just asking me, um, if I would buy him these plushies that he saw on a YouTube show that are $30 each. Oh, um, I see your hand. And then you disappeared. Go ahead and speak if you want to. I put your hand came up and then I put it back down, but I couldn't see your name. You're having mic troubles. Okay, I lost that. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, wasn't there also the the concern that the way some of the advertisements uh, were being set up were like um, troublesome? A hundred percent, yeah, majorly manipulative. Yeah, yeah that, that awful woman who created something called the nag factor, remember her? And she's like, is it ethical? 
I don't know. But anyway, so we, we get them when, that, when they're young and then you have a customer for life. So is there a lot of care about scrambling anybody's brain? Yeah, not really. So yeah, absolutely great point. So yeah, so um, same concern with television. Remember I told you the 70s and the 80s were the period in which people were very, very concerned with the, you know, negative effects of TV. So TV was supposed to be a classroom in your home. We were going to learn languages. We were all going to be smarter as, as you know, a side effect of television. And really, is television a vehicle for entertainment or a vehicle for selling you things? Selling it well, exactly. I mean, you know, I set that up and you hit it right out of the park. Selling good, Denise, as well. Ah. <laughs> so, on the left, somebody make my heart sing and tell me who that is on the left. The A and the D should give you a, a hint. His famous sort of signature A D. Um, this painting was also recreated with Gary Oldman in it for um, the Dracula movie that was made by Francis Ford Coppola. And he's also doing A and D with his fingers. I don't know if you could see that. He's going A, A, D, Albrecht Dürer. So mostly known for his etchings and woodcuts. Um, we saw it way at the beginning of the class with the man trying to draw a woman, sort of trying to foreshorten her with a grid. That was him. But he was also an excellent painter. He was a brilliant person. Um, he's the first person to sort of treat uh, just a random piece of turf as a subject for a major oil painting. He is a brilliant person. He did like a studies of bugs and things and also woodcuts and engravings. So fabulous, fabulous. Who's this? We didn't see this one in our class. We got the hand perfect though. Is it that Japanese guy? Yes. I forget his name. Anyone know? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Look at that. Well done. Anyone know? Okay, so you guys look him up and why is he relevant in the computer chapter? Okay, so what we're looking at is very similar to the machine that somebody invented in 1700 to help him weave fabrics. Does anyone remember who that was? J.M. Jacquard. Yes, yes. So remember the Jacquard loom and then now it's called Jacquard print, but letting those needles fall into the holes, which is a specialized graphics computer. And so this graphics computer with hole punches eventually translates into algebraic communication, which translates into the, you know, positive and negative answers, which translates into the zero one. Um, uh, uh, binary. Code. Yeah, binary code. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you guys, Denise and King came up with Yasumasa Morimura for the other one. Yes, perfect. Um, which turned into the Colossus and the ENIAC and finally the PC and the home computer. So home computing, of, of course. Okay. What's this called when photography is like this? If I were to take this one and put it back here, it would be out of what? Almost, Denise. Out of sequence? Out of sequence. So this is called sequential photography. Sequential photography. And who is the photographer that showed on his magic lantern slideshow toured around the world is that um, Muybridge? edward moybridge right does all four of a horse's hooves leave the ground yes it does animal locomotion in 1889 tours the world with over 130 interspecies studies of people moving in all sorts of fabulous ways so why do artists absolutely love this Is it like, yeah, this old chestnut? Because it could paint exactly what the motion would be. Yes. In yeah, for the first time. And so why is, why is this photographer doing this and not Louis Daguerre a couple of years before? How was Daguerre hampered 
and there had been a breakthrough in something that allows you to go to the duration of what? Does it have to do with the camera? Yes. And the, the shutter lens and the time? A faster shutter speed, yes. Okay. So if you make the shutter speed quicker, you can actually capture things that you couldn't if you have like, Daguerre was working with a 30 second exposure. I mean, can you imagine here, let's, let's wait for it. <laughs> and you're like, I mean, it's still open. It's still, that's why he couldn't capture humans. And now it's like, boop, boop, and you can actually get things done, which is great. Um, who's this? Are you ready to fall in love all over again? Like we did before? Yes, clear photos with sports, exactly, Christopher. With a quick shutter speed, which makes the background blurry. So you have to decide if you want a deep field of um, focus or shallow focus. And there's all of these tricks that you have to do to, to get things going fast. So who's our, our Russian boyfriend who solved the game of modernist, reductive, the quest of reductive abstraction? Was it Sergey? No, it uh, starts with a K, his first name. Casimir. I'm gonna tell him to break up with all of you. Malovic? Yes, King, he's, he's, he's still with you. He's floating around you now. Casimir Malovich, Casimir Malovich. So this was his first attempt. What's this called? Russian, so we had Italian futurism, Russian constructivism, remember Vladimir Tatlin's big building, and then Russian, the suprematism. Yes, Russian suprematism, the supremacy of feeling, right? The supremacy of feeling over fact, that the feeling is everything. And so he first did black square on white, and then he just went, bam white on white wham so again if you didn't know the rules of modernism you'd go garbage but but of course we do so we're all like genius isn't that funny um so casimir malevich so again this is a big part of modernism that if you're going to do abstraction there are the, there are rules to the game so you're not just hey you know i'm just going to do whatever i want everybody's playing by the same rules and seeing what they come up with so it's actually very interesting so whose is this? And this doesn't look like what we've seen from him before. It wasn't this geometric, it's usually, but it's totally non-representational. It's discussing music and the ebb and flow of music. This is just another one of his paintings. Remember he was a member of the Blue Rider music mu movement, it was, Franz Mark and this Russian. So musical based abstraction, right? Okay. Primitivism. So remember we were, I was dangling this around when we were talking about Pablo Picasso. So primitivism is the collecting of African and oceanic masks to um, look at a, a purer and more elemental way of depicting the human. So all of these artists in modernism are classically trained, academically trained, and they're, they're desperately trying to break away from their academic training to get to a more primal truth, they thought, a more, more sort of elemental um, depiction and sort of stop uh, you know, doing chiaroscuro and stop the illusion of three dimensionality, embrace the flatness, embrace the color, embrace the feeling and stop getting away from something that's so calculated. And so they thought that this, these collections would help them sort of get closer to a truthfulness in a way. So primitivism has been framed by many as being somehow denigrating the, the original subject matter that all oh, these Europeans came and they ripped these things out of their original context. And um, what these artists were were huge fans of this work and these aren't they're not stealing into you know uh you know uh, tribal homes in the dead of night and taking their masks and stuff they were being sold so 
you know, it's not as terrible as it seems. Oh, so this is a fabulously modern uh, home and smack in the middle of it is this dour woman painted by a man who was at one point the most avant-garde painter in Paris until his lifelong rival came along. And they hated each other. So who painted the green stripe? Matisse? Yeah, Matisse, Picasso, they hated each other. Um, but Matisse came first. What ism is this? Bovism? Bovism, wild beastism. This only a wild beast could create such a monstrous image, embracing the flatness, showing a green stripe down the face of a woman when what he's really doing is he's using color as he feels, um, uh, you know, sort of more organically than as he had been trained. So this is supposed to be the, the transition shadow between the bright of the window and the reflective light of the, the home. And so here he's using more, you know, cool and warm colors to depict and very flattened space to depict something that normally you would have, you know, carefully rounded out and rounded out. So wild beastism. Who is this woman? From what country did she come from? Kaiser Wilhelm II called her work gutter art, while well, all socially conscious artwork. And later she was afraid to leave this country because this person- It was Germany. Germany, good. And she was worried that if she left, Hitler would exact retribution on her family, so she never left. Is she pro-war like the Italian futurists? No. No, she is anti-war because her youngest son dies in World War. This time I know it's two. No, no, <laughs> it's okay. It's World War I, right? So her youngest son dies in World War I, but she stays in Germany and actually lives long enough to see the rise of Hitler. So that's why uh, I pulled a mind scramble on you. So yeah, her youngest son dies in World War I and all of her art is socially conscious and deals with the theme of pacifism and you know, um, sort of social injustice, right? The weavers cycle um, about the, the people losing their jobs to the mechanization of their craft, which we saw you know, with the, the jacquard punch machine and things like that. Okay. So art, uh, oh, so art that imitates a previous style. So what is that called when art is ironic, it is pastiche, it uh, will call consumer and celebrity icons forward? Appropriation? It's a, yeah, it's appropriation, which is a tool of modernist artists or postmodernist artists. So appropriation actually fits into both because if you think about Dada, which was always ahead of its time, they they used appropriation art, but lots of this. So I guess appropriation deals with both of them. But if we're looking at American Gothic with Miss Piggy and Kermit, are we looking at oil on canvas, lone genius, uh, or totally original visual language? What does that represent? Oil on canvas, Lone genius, totally original visual language. Who are we describing? Modernism or postmodernism? Modernism. Modernism. So if you're seeing Miss Piggy and Kermit, is that totally original, brand new visual language oil on canvas? No, that'd be no. postmodernism. That's postmodern. So look, this. If, if, I, if you were to count on your hand how many times American Gothic is used in a postmodern way, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, have, you'd run out of hands, right? So this is postmodernism or to use sort of things that you recognize. So when you're watching Kill Bill, and I wanted to call back to Tarantino to remind you, um, what you're seeing is, is Bruce Lee. You know, that, the, you know, what's her name? Uma Thurman is wearing Bruce Lee's Game of Death costume. You know what I mean? So all everything is layer upon layer of postmodern references that you're supposed to understand and, and get. Um, oh, this, whoops, this was about appropriation. 
um, and how some, this is, some people get caught. Um, so these were the original photographs and then some artists turned them into drawings. And of course this is, even though it's an okay art practice in comic book making and things like that, it's a major, major no-no. Um, so then remember, what is modernism? I just said the three hallmarks kind of over and over to make the point about postmodernism. But again, lone genius, oil on canvas, brand new visual language. Postmodern is um, collaborative, you know, oftentimes, even though sometimes it is one person, it's not a, one of a kind original. Oftentimes it's a repeatable thing and it is not the original artistic visual language. It's referencing all sorts of other things. Okay. So remember we talked about Rene Magritte, but if we're talking about Cicini Paz and Peep, we're also talking about that Ferdinand de Saussure and Saussurean theory. Does anyone remember what the two elements are? So you're talking about the thing you're talking about and the language, what's that called? The signified and the signifier. Yes, so the signified is the pipe and the signifier is the word pipe. And so when he's saying this isn't a pipe, it's not really, but it is, et cetera, you know? So it's, it's really clever and it's stupid and it's funny. And what we need is funny art. And this is like, it's actually very clever and funny and silly. Who's this? We, we already worked this out, but I want you to say it. You can see it in the left. Paul. Somebody say the title or the name. Warm colors come forward, cool colors recede, multiple angles. That was the basket of apples. Basket of apples by? Cezanne. Cezanne, see, it says P. Cezanne here, Paul Cezanne. Good. So again, um, flattening of space, deliberately not contouring edges, um, trying to give things mass and weight, trying to show you all things at once. This just blows Picasso's mind, this kind of simple painting. Who's this? And this is not a woman, by the way. This is kind of a tribute to Duchamp. Does anyone recognize this photographer that was part of the NEA or the National Endowment of the Arts program that pissed off Senator Jesse Helms? Is that the one with all the penises? That's the one. Does anybody remember his name? Jesse, the, uh, um, Jesse Helms is the the um, senator. Who okay, came. sorry. No, that's perfect. And he kept saying, "Why is the public funding this?" And he used two examples. He used Andre, is that Ma Maplethorpe? It's Maplethorpe. It's Robert Maplethorpe. Okay. So as you said, the penises of Robert Maplethorpe and Andre Serrano, his Christ. Remember, I showed you the crucifix submerged in the artist's urine. So these are the two examples that uh, this senator, you know, showed and said, hey, guys, why are we paying for this? Uh, you know, and he said, I don't care what you do in your own private time, but if the taxpayer is paying for this, there should be some sort of, you know, return on investment. And this is sort of, you know, perverse. And so there's this big controversy about whether or not, you know, the art can be censored and should it be funded and should it not be funded and how deep a dive should we allow before it's kind of like obscenity. Um, which is interesting. Is he the one that defended it with because it was in the Bible or had to do with the with biblical? I don't know. I don't know that much. I didn't follow that. I was like in the 80s, I was a kid, but no, I, I don't remember that. For, is that in the book? Maybe he did. I thought I thought it was. I thought that he he said that it should be allowed because he's just making a point of of what happens in the Bible, like a religious thing. With the year, like the urine, the cross in the urine. Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know uh, the point he made about Serrano. I know he brought the two artists up. That's interesting. Maybe he did. I, I don't know. I don't know if I was a lawyer or even a senator, if I'd make a biblical point, I'd just make an obscenity point, I guess. But, you know, that's a, I don't know. How interesting. Um, does anyone know the name of this artwork or the artist? It's a woman. Uh huh. Mm 
me see the chat. Is it Betty Sar? Betty Sar, yes. And what's it called? It's funny how they found it perverse, but not perverse. Having a sexy Pepsi ad with a child on it. Was her child in the sexy Pepsi ad? One? It was one where he was like, there was a woman laying down in a bikini with a lifeguard. And then he oh, standing yeah. over her as it well. It was like pass out. Oh my God. Oh, 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 it's sexy Pepsi. I thought you were talking about the diet Pepsi, one small calorie. And I was, that's, see how perverted I am? I go straight to the sexy one. Sexy Pepsi with the guy, the lifeguard. Yes. Um, because Sexy Pepsi isn't uh, funded by your grandma's taxes. And Piss Christ is. That, you know what I mean? So it's like the Pepsi Corporation, if they want to piss people off and drive consumers away, you know, go right ahead. But when, you know, when you're, you know, part of your taxes go to the NEA or public radio or PBS or something. And, but it's, you know, you just go like, ugh. Um, so anyway, Betty Sar, what's this called? Here's a huge hint behind her. Is it Aunt Jemima? Aunt Jemima, that's a part of the title. Well, anyway, what- Liberation of Aunt Jemima. Liberation of Aunt Jemima. And so what is Betty Sar using to create this? Oh, and let's use the fancy word that you came up with before. It's not a collage, but a- Assemblage. It's an assemblage. You have to do this with your hair or like at least, you know, like, like that when you say that where you know, it's, yeah, it's an assemblage. So what, what is she using? Did she sculpt that Aunt Jemima? No, she's using like a shoe box with like cotton and just different things around the house. Yes. And, it. and yeah, and, and where'd she get the, the Aunt Jemima figure? What is that? She cut it off of the boxes. Yes, in the background. And then she found a figure and this is kitchenalia. This is black Americana kitchenalia or things that you would find in the home as like salt and pepper shakers, string holders, uh, notepad things. And yet she put weapons in her hands and cotton pods. And then this hard to see, it looks like part of her skirt, but it's actually the black power fist here. So it's a protest piece. Whoa, what are we seeing here? Uh, no, the background is not, it's not pop art. It looks like, it looks like Marilyn, right? It looks like the Warhol Marilyns, um, but it isn't. This is out of the pop art era. This is in like the 1980s, I believe. So pop art was like the 60s, but yes, it does look like the, the Warhol's Marilyn. So that, wow, good eye. Excellent. I, I never thought of that before. A trip oh, to the moon. A trip to the moon by, are you ready to say it in French? George, George who? Melier. George Melier. Again, we could like, yeah, George Melier. Um, and he is a was a magician, and he was the first to do what in his movies. And now we, you know, we see it all the time. What is editing? Yeah, he did jump cuts, which allowed him to do what? So when you're watching Bewitched and she says, I'm gonna conjure up a coffee, gring, and then they stop the camera and then some guy puts a coffee in her hand and they go and they start the camera again. What's that called? A special effects? Special effects, special effects. So he, he invents the jump cuts and special effects and Matt work, remember the man with the rubber head? Um, and, uh, and his work of this, so what, category would uh this trip to the moon be in would it be um was this type of moon in moulin rouge if it's the one with you and mcgregor it was probably a, a postmodern reference to this so if the moon has a face on it it probably is a reference i have not seen it um uh is this a crime drama is this a comedy is this what is this what's this category called when you talk about outer space and science and stuff sci-fi science fiction yeah so always think about the the category that something falls in so it's interesting that it's like early science fiction yeah perfect well so early movie making so why did movie making move to california 
because we have so gosh darn much what? Sunlight. Sunlight, right? So you'd be shooting in what's called a black Mariah, which was basically walls with no ceiling because we needed lots of light for exposure for early cameras. And because movies were silent, you could be shooting one movie right next door to another movie. And okay, okay, now kiss her. All right, now jump off that cliff. Okay, now uh, now smack her around a little bit. That's, you know, the director could be, you know, see how he's got this bullhorn. All right, now, now stop. Now, okay, now you strangle her. Okay, and uh, now look sad, now look happy. And so like, this is all going on, like, you know, while the camera is rolling, stop it. My cat is chewing the straw on my, my drink. So early, early filmmaking. Um, Jeepers. So who is the director attached to these two films? It says D.W. Griffith yes. on it. And uh, on the right is Birth of a Nation, which was first. Excellent. And what's the second one that he made sort of as an atonement to Birth of a Nation? Famous, gigantic Babylon set from the movie. Let's see in the chat. Intolerance. Thank you. Thank you, Estefania. And um, what did D.W. Griffith pioneer? Why do we still talk about his movies today? Was it his movie sets? Uh, his sets were certainly enormous and eye popping and you it's because he was really racist. Well, yeah, we talk. Absolutely. We talk about that element of uh, Birth of a Nation. What else? What did he pioneer? What did he come up with? What was he the first to do in films? And he really was the first. Isn't it like close-up shots or something? Sort of. Or, yeah, like some sort of shots. Cutting uh -huh. out of order? I remember. Uh, editing? Uh, no, the, the baby scene was a, a battleship Potemkin, Denise. But you're that's good. You're remembering that tr traumatic experience we all went through watching the Odessa Steps sequence. Now, he, can't, he did a lot of things. Was it W. Griffith. Thumbing out of order? No, he did a lot of intercutting, which is different than like the Great Train Robbery, where basically you're just, you know, like, which is great because Great Train Robbery isn't like a play where you just sit there. Like Melies movies are like a play. You watch uh, them prepare to go to the moon, and then you watch them go to the moon with no cuts. So, um, goodness. So, uh, this would have been full of cuts. Is he shooting always in the daytime? D.W. Griffith? We, we take this for granted, all of these things that he did that were totally brand new. Campfire filming, uh, filming with different colored stock, like peach stock, uh, inserting uh, flares of like a couple of red uh, film parts when things got scary or gory, um, intercutting uh, the epic, you know, filming out of doors, filming great sweeps of people moving, the iris eye in and then the iris eye out to focus on a certain element. I mean, this guy came up with so many incredible things. Um, so we were just talking about this. So who is this? Is he a modernist or a postmodernist? Postmodernist. Postmodernist, because uh, is this in a totally original visual language and something nobody's ever seen before? No. No, is this is the Marilyn Diptych. It's Marilyn Diptych, and which is funny because Diptych means a double paneled altarpiece. So obviously that doesn't make, you know, like, okay. Uh, actually, technically it would be a Marilyn Triptych, right? So the center panel and the two panels open like this. Um, what is the medium of this? It's paint, but it's a certain technique. Is it silk screening? It's a silk screen. And is silk screen a one of a kind? Or can you make many? No, you can make many. You can make many. So we keep go going farther and farther away from the modernist idea of the one of a kind original oil on canvas, totally brand new. This is a multiple. Um, it was created often in his factory where he would just crank these things out, sometimes not even silk screened by Warhol himself. So it's all over the place. So celebrity icons. Um, and then somebody mentioned earlier, we were talking about Jemima, the type of art that it is, or the ism that it's called, it's called, it's from the 60s. It's little umbrella is called something art. Pop. Pop art, pop art. Yes, absolutely. Oh, so who's this? 
Arrow Sela V. That's Arrow Sela V on the right. Duchamp. That's Marcel Duchamp, right? And what uh, happening are we looking at here with all of this string? His hilarious stunt called where they were going to have the first papers of surrealism show in 1942. All the people were going to show up and go see the exhibit. So he shows up the night before and he does 16 miles of string, <laughs> um, which is just brilliant. And so he does the greatest photographs. What's the art movement that he was part of in the very beginning? Not surrealism, it was the one that came before it, which was? Anti-World War I, anti-art, ready-mades. It must be baby talk, it must be. Not mama. But Dada. Dada. <laughs> I pulled it out of you guys. You you guys are scaring me that you didn't get Marcel Duchamp Dada. So always remember Dada. Remember the element of chance. Remember a toise de page at talon or dropping the, the string measuring a meter to create a new measurement. Um, the fountain, which is, you know, he went out and bought bottle rack, um, things like that. Um, the, the happening, um, the performance art, Dada. So gorilla girls, gorilla fighting in gorilla masks. So gorilla is spelled as the fighters, you know, the, the rebel fighters, gorilla masks protect their identity. Why? Why do you have to protect your identity if there's some chick in the art world? Because they want it to be more about what they're saying than themselves, because they want it to last longer than them. Right. Uh, well, what are they saying? That women uh, deserve to be in the art world as well. Yes. And what were they, what did they fear if they made a big, loud, you know, loud commotion about women needing to be in the art world and they're busting people for their art practices? What happens to you if you complain at work, if you're the squeaky wheel? What retaliation. Happens? Yeah, retaliation. And so the masks are a very clever way to say like, hey, listen, don't, you know, don't completely ignore my art if I make, make big complaints and stuff. And of course they become celebrities in and of themselves. So, wow, is this artwork? Oh, so what's the umbrella this is under? You can throw a whole lot of isms at me. Judy Chicago, very good, Estefania. Feminism, feminism, and is this modern or postmodern? And why is it postmodern? Oops, I just answered it. Why is it postmodern? Lone genius, did Judy Chicago do all this by herself? No, it was collaborative. With collaboration. Um, is this uh, oil on canvas? No, it's pottery. No, it's pottery. It's it's uh, engraving. It's uh, it's uh, tile making, etc. Um, uses textiles, etc. So low, uh, you know, kind of crafty art that's not considered like you know painting or sculpture. And what's the subject matter? Didn't she do it after the Last Supper? After the Last Supper, right? So thirteen people at a table. So she did. Um, last Supper, Last Supper, Last Supper, which makes the elemental symbol of women how? What's what's the symbol? The, the triangle. triangle for yeah, the, the pubic triangle. Women in history. Estefania, you are kicking some butt. I am not worried about your quiz at all. So yeah, women in history, the elemental symbol of women. I mean, didn't that turn out wonderfully? The names of women, giving them a place at the table. So feminism, postmodernism, collaboration, high and low you know art all smashing together so basquiat basquiat is this like the greatest like photo of all time and it's probably a warhol actually now i'm actually noticing for the first time it's a polaroid what do you want to bet warhol took this picture right um handsome and young where did he go what happened to him 
He died of an overdose. overdose. Died of a heroin overdose. I think he was 27 years old. Um, what's the ism that he is connected to? He's postmodern ism, but it's actually connected to some a word that we use to describe Jackson Pollock's work. It's not abstract expressionism. It's what's the word for new? Think about the matrix. Neoism. Neo-expressionism. He is a neo-expressionist or a new type of expressionist expressing his feelings through what? What does he do to his canvases? He takes an old art piece and then he modernizes it in like the current culture yes. and climate of what's going on. Yes, so he likes Baroque art. So for instance, he took the, the woman from, uh, he, oh, he likes Baroque art, he likes jazz. He takes the lady out of Manet's Olympia and gives her her own space. What does he do all over his art? He does something all over it, writes all of these he things. Paint, paints graffiti text? Yeah, graffiti sort of nonsensical text. He'd write same old, meaning same old shit all over the place or sort of like the obnoxious liberals or not for sale. So text plus sort of graphic images. So he's, and, and is he French? Jean-Michel Basquiat? No. No, he is not. That was a trick. I tried to trick you. No, he's American. He's an American painter. Who's this lady? Well, gosh, darn it. Why did I have to put a big quote on it? Who is this woman? Jean Kilborn. It's Jean Kilborn. And what does she study? What has she spent now? I guess now it would be 50 years studying. How women are portrayed in advertising. Yeah, primarily women, but you know, men as well. But yeah, how and how it affects you and the ideological construct that it presents to you and 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 the increasing levels of like sexuality and violence and how and how that filters down to you. It's absolutely interesting. Um <laughs> who's this handsome devil? Anybody know? You can get a huge hint by looking behind him. Is that Jackson Pollock? Pollock? It's Jack the Dripper. It's Jackson Pollock. Yes, it is. Um, you find cigarette ashes in his painting. You find um, like uh, sand in his, he would throw sand in his painting. He would use house paint instead of fancy paint because of the amount he was using. So he he's a modernist. He's doing oil on canvas. He's a lone genius. He's creating a brand new visual language, but he's using very sort of unconventional um, oil to create his things. What's the, so he's doing abstract expressionism. So he's expressing his feelings in an abstract way. So remember abstract expressionism is Pollock, neo-expressionism is Basquiat. So neo-abstract expressionism or neo sort of expressing your feelings in this way. Okay. Oh, I don't know what that's for. I guess that would be to say goodbye. I also need to go, I need to keep the slideshow going so the subtitles continue. You need to look into Lee Miller, who was a surrealist. So look in your surrealism chapter for Lee Miller. Um, you need to look into Michael Mandeberg in your television chapter and the studies that he did. I'm sorry, in your computer chapter. Um, we mentioned him for a minute. So Michael Mandeberg from your computer chapter. You need to look into Moshe Eisenman and the studies that he did with how your eye moves when you're looking at advertising. You need to look at the Selenium camera and how it promised that you could see by electricity and how it's important in the development of television. Um, we talked about that. We talked about that. And Santa Fe Railroad ads and how they described American Indians. So these were the things when I was looking at your um, test that took me by surprise and were not on your slide list. So you need to look into those things. You need to firm up every artist that you mention. You should be able to either say um, Pablo Picasso. You should be able to off the top of your head go Guernica. You know, why did he do, why did he do the giant cubist protest piece Guernica? And you have to be able to say kind of immediately because Hitler bombed the small Spanish town of Guernica, you know, and so he wanted the world to be aware of it. 
So you need to be able to sort of like, uh, you know, still life with chair caning, Picasso, cubist, you know, uh, collage, uh, Demoiselles de Avignon, Picasso, proto cubist, multiple perspectives linked to Cezanne. You know what I mean? So like just broad strokes. So be able to sort of connect Judy Chicago to the dinner party and then be able to go postmodern feminist, you know? So you, you should just hit the, hit the big notes. You know, why, why in the world are we talking about Quentin Tarantino? Oh, we talked about him because of storytelling, right? Um, we talked about Jeff Koons and how he does massive self-promotion, you know, lack of craft, postmodern referencing celebrity culture. Do you know what I mean? Um, I have five minutes left. Alisa, I see your hand. Thank you. I had a qu two questions. Is the final multiple choice like we've been doing in our quiz? Yep. And the second one is, will we have class? Because our final is the 20th next week or no? No, this is your last class. Oh God, did I, did I short shrift you guys a class? Um, no, uh, there's no class. So this is the final one. Okay. Woohoo! So yes, uh, multiple choice, exact same format as before. Um, let me give you a hint. If you see all of these or none of these, it's, you should be very careful <laughs> because if I'm saying none of these, you need to go, wait a minute. Don't just choose something in panic. Sometimes I'm going, you know, is Judy Chicago from France, India, or China or none of these? Hmm. None of these. That's oh, Gabriel bless you. I, this semester went quickly in the end. But certainly in the beginning, it just got, I'd look at all the Zooms we had in front of us and go, good gracious, that seems like a lot. So you have such a sweet soul to say that. Uh, you will have access to the recording of this meeting. I'm recording this today for the class yesterday, but I think I'll also post it for you guys just for your own information. Yay! Um, <laughs> so, because uh, there's a lot, there's a lot. So I'm going to lecture you very, very quickly. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Um, okay. So you're all getting a, a major already, right? You're all majoring in something. I feel your pain. I um, didn't know what I was doing until I was in my thirties. I went this away, I went that away, wrong direction. I admire people who know what they wanna do and they did it. I went to, got my bachelor's in radio, television and film. And then I went a year and a half to an MBA in marketing and I hated it. And I would be laying on the floor in the library crying until I fell backwards into art history. And I'm doing what I absolutely adore. So if you don't know what you're doing and you're just heading in a direction randomly, I totally get it. Do me a favor, I'm begging you. Think about your 40s and your 50s. When you have your first child or your second child and you realize, oh my God, um, I need to make a lot more money than I do and I didn't prepare for this. You know, Cause when I was in my 20s, I was like, I don't know, I'll just figure it out, you know, and I get there, I didn't you know, I'll just, you know. Um, oh my God, if I had, you know, going to be a phlebotomist and be somebody who draws blood, be an x-ray technician, be a dental technician, um, be a chiropractor, uh, that takes like two years and you can set up your own practice, go into dentistry and you have more take-home pay than some surgeons do. Um, I have a friend who just changed careers and went into LAUSD, uh, just two years ago, she was working at Pier 1. She has two kids now. She's killing herself, even though she was a manager. Horrible hours, low pay. She went into the certification program for LAUSD two years long. She's making more money than I do now. Okay. Uh, so think about the money you want to make. And please don't major in something wishy-washy. Please don't get a liberal arts degree. I know it sounds lofty, liberal arts. I, I know a little bit of a lot of things. I'm begging you, please don't. Please please focus on something and you have to talent stack. So if you're getting a graphic arts degree, please have a minor in art history. So if somebody says, um, I'm getting a graphic arts degree. Um, and if you throw at me Baroque style advertisement in the style of Caravaggio, you know what they're talking about. Or, or you can steal like Picasso told you to Italian futurist aesthetic and blow everybody's minds. And it's fair because it's postmodernism, and you're totally allowed to do that. You're all not just majoring in one thing now. You're going to get a double major or a major and a minor at least. You want to know something nobody told me when I was going to school? Sometimes a minor is just an, a, a 12 to 15 more units. 
and all of you are already taking 12 units a semester to keep your financial aid rolling. So why don't you tack on a minor, gosh darn it. I could have had a minor in classics. I graduated. I had taken all of these classics in uh, these classes in Greco-Roman history and mythology. Well, guess what I found out after I graduated? I had a minor in classics and I didn't know it because I never looked at my own records and you can't tack it on when you're done. So look at the schedule of majors and minors, please, very carefully. Sometimes you're already halfway there and you don't even know it. And you can have a much more fulsome and impressive degree when you're done. Um, the best thing that you guys are doing now is you're, you're accruing units and you're marching forward. So say you blow a class, like the semester gets really intense and you've blown it, who cares? Just petition to retake the class, retake the class and keep going. Your family will always say, oh, you're still in school. And you're always going, yeah, and you're kind of embarrassed. Well, guess what they never ask you again once you graduate? Are you still in school? Then it'll become, aren't you married yet? And then it'll become, where are your children? So they'll always be sort of pressuring you to get out of school. Don't let that bother you because you're gonna be the one with this gigantic degree when you're done. So you're already in college accruing debt. You can always push the debt aside or pay like income-based repayment. But please, please, please think about what you're doing. Every time you do a speech in a class or a group project or you do an art exhibition, you add it to your gosh damn resume because now you are your own agent, right? You are your agent and you take care of your resume. And if you are an artist or a graphic designer, you have to keep your own website, okay? Create your own website, go on Squarespace, create a website, get your domain name that should be your name, right? So jenniferkleinart.com or whatever. And then you keep it really um, uh, uh, current. I got a job at the Walt Disney Company writing for a Japanese Disney magazine because I had an amusing blog called Red Kryptonite, because Red Kryptonite makes Superman crazy. If I hadn't had that blog to say, yeah, look at my blog, they wouldn't have given me the job. So this is Los Angeles. We're not in Minnesota or something. So everybody's going to be fighting for jobs. So you have to, you can't be like, oh, can you give me a couple of weeks to get all of my papers together? Keep your resume current. Everything you do in college goes on your resume. Everywhere you travel goes on your resume. Get a website and keep it. You're going to have tack a minor onto your major now. Okay, so think about it. You could go into health services. Did you know that if you're a health inspector and you take environmental science, you get a badge, you get a car, you get your own office and you get to show up at restaurants and scare everybody half to death. You're like an FBI agent, okay? So please, please, please do the most with your degree. Keep marching forward. Don't let little hiccups academically freak you out or scare you or demoralize you. You just keep going. Yeah, Gabriel, don't forget to network. It's important to know people. Do you know that the people who are your colleagues now you'll keep bumping into for the rest of your career? So all the people coming up with me in grad school for art history are my colleagues now. So you better be cool, be nice because they're gonna be the ones who are now like on the, you know, on the, the chair of some college or something and they're gonna give you a job. But please, please think about your future. Think about your finances and make your, make your degree as major as you can. Please don't get a wishy-washy degree. Make it count, make money later. And if you're over 18, you can start uh, investing in an IRA or a Roth IRA, go see a financial advisor. It should be free because they make money in uh, enrolling you in funds and stuff. If you were to be able to put away a little bit of your financial aid every time you get it into an IRA or a Roth IRA, say you have $10,000 by the time you're 25 and you let it roll to the time you're 65, you'll have $700,000 waiting for you. And you'll also have an OSHIT fund for, oh, hey, you need all four tires now. Um, you can pull it out with a penalty, but at least it's your money that you're drawing from and that you've been smart enough to save. And if you let it roll at a 6% gain every year, you'd be surprised by the time you're 40, you're going to have tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. So think about that now, for God's sakes, not when you're 40, do it when you're 20. Okay. Or Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Wait for a dip, wait for the price to go down, throw $200 into it and let it roll and see what happens. You know, go on Coinbase, start an account, throw a couple hundred dollars in it and just let it, let it do its thing, okay? So think about your future, think about your degree, you are your own agent, okay? So you represent you, so take care of yourself. If, if a class, you fail a class, or you don't do well, who cares, just... Take it again, keep accruing units until you graduate with a fabulous degree. And you can go, boy, I was smart. Okay, you're all a bunch of geniuses. It's been so much fun. 
talking to you all. I hope to high five you at some point in the future when we're all on campus again, or you'll see me at TJ Maxx or Starbucks. So howdy, howdy. Thank you all. I'll see you um, in the future.